Now let's take a look at all 10 of my favorite films of 1979, starting with Apocalypse Now, Francis Ford Coppola's epic drama about Americans in Vietnam. And then came Breaking Away, about high school graduates getting ready to take their chances in the real world. Third was Michael Cimino's The Deer Hunter, about three steel workers who went off to fight the war in Vietnam. Rainer Werner Fassbinder's The Marriage of Maria Braun was another war movie about the reconstruction of post-war West Germany and an ambitious woman who was reconstructed right along with it. Fifth was <laughs> Hair, an inspired and brilliant musical recalling the age of Aquarius. And then I chose St. Jack, starring Ben Gazzara as an American pimp in Singapore. Seventh was Kramer vs. Kramer with Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep as a divorced couple in a child custody fight. Number eight was the uncommonly intelligent thriller the China Syndrome with Jane, Jack Lemmon and Jane Fonda in the story of a nuclear plant meltdown. Ninth was Werner Herzog's Nosferatu, a brilliant and macabre retelling of the legend of Count Dracula. And in tenth place, I chose inevitably Ten, the Blake <laughs> Edwards comedy starring Dudley Moore as a man hopelessly in love with a vision of female perfection played by Bo Derrick. Yeah, somehow I remember her in that picture. <laughs> well, we agree, isn't this interesting? We agree on seven out of ten. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's my list in order of personal preference. My number one favorite film of 1979 was Hair, a stirring musical of the 60s with striking images provided by director Milos Forman. Number two, Kramer vs. Kramer, all the details right and beautifully acted by Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep. Number three on my list is The Deer Hunter, which is on both Roger and my list this year because it didn't open until 1979 in all but three cities in the United States, so we consider it a 1979 film. It's a powerhouse drama of the grim realities of the Vietnam War. Number four, Breaking Away, the year's sunniest film, a sweet slice of middle Americana. Number five, Woody Allen's provocative and very funny Manhattan. Number six, The Marriage of Maria Braun, one of two German films on my list. Number seven, the other German film, Werner Herzog's Nosferatu, a fresh retelling of the vampire legend with Klaus Kinski as the creepiest and also the saddest Count Dracula ever on film. Number eight, The Onion Field, a brutal thriller about a real-life seven-year trial of two lowlifes accused of murdering a policeman. Number nine, Time After Time, an original and romantic science fiction mystery and thriller. It's got everything. <laughs> and number ten, The China Syndrome, which was a terrific thriller even before that accident at Three Mile Island. Now let's look through our entire lists. Here is my list of the year's top ten films, beginning with Robert De Niro's knockout performance as fighter Jake LaMotta in Raging Bull. Second, Robert Redford film of Ordinary People. Third, Coal Miner's Daughter with Sissy Spacek as country singer Loretta Lynn. Fourth, The Tree of the Wooden Clogs, or Mono Olmi's portrait of an Italian peasant colony. Fifth, Kagamusha, Akira Kurosawa's 16th century Japanese samurai drama. Sixth, Being There with Peter Sellers as Chance the Gardener. This was a 1979 film, as far as the Academy Awards were concerned, but except for a couple of cities being there played everywhere else in this country in 1980. Seventh, The Black Stallion, another 1979 film for the Oscars, but a 1980 film for most of the nation. Eighth, The Blues Brothers, an uproarious musical comedy with John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. Ninth, The Great Santini with Robert Duvall as a concerned father we love to hate. Tenth, the Stuntman, a tricky mystery that celebrates the ways movies manipulate us. Okay, Gene, that's your list. Here's my list of the year's 10 best films. First on my list is The Black Stallion, a visionary epic about a boy and a horse. In second place, Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. Third place goes to Kagamusha, the thoughtful samurai drama. In fourth place, the late Peter Sellers in Being There. Fifth place goes to Robert Redford's Ordinary People. Number six is The Great Santini with Robert Duvall. Seventh place goes to The Empire Strikes Back, the Star Wars sequel. Number eight stars Sissy Spacek and Coal Miner's Daughter. Number nine, American Gigolo with Richard Gere. And in tenth place, Best Boy, Ira Wall's documentary about his retarded cousin Philly and how he learns at the age of 52 how to go out in the world and be a little more Let's independent. Let's take another look now at the all ten films on my best list of 1981. In tenth place, Red, Warren Beatty's ambitious epic. Ninth was Tess, Roman Polanski's lush, elegiac story of a doomed 19th century heroine. In eighth place, Body Heat, a visual salute to the Hollywood crime films of the 1940s. My seventh place film was Michael Mann's Thief, starring James Caan in a dynamic thriller with enormous force. Sixth place goes to Atlantic City, about the winners, losers, and drifters along the boardwalk. In fifth place, Heartland, a young widow's struggle on the American frontier. In fourth place, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Third was he Gates of Heaven, that fascinating documentary about pet cemeteries. 
Second place, Chariots of Fire, the British film about two runners in the 1924 Paris Olympics. And my choice for the year's best film, My Dinner with Andre, a brilliant exercise of the art of conversation. And now for my list. In 10th place, The French Lieutenant's Woman, Meryl Streep and Jeremy Irons in an adaptation of John Fall's romantic novel. Number nine, Body Heat. In 8th place, Melvin and Howard, which is a 1980 film as far as the Academy Awards are concerned, but which opened in more American cities this year. It's an American picturesque of the Howard Hughes and the Mormon Will. Number seven, Prince of the City. And number six, Bye Bye Brazil, the portrait of a nation and a traveling carnival of entertainers, all in transition. Gates of Heaven is number five, and number four, Mon Uncle de Marique, Alain Rene's study of why we behave the way we behave. Raiders of the Lost Ark is number three, My Dinner with Andre is number two, and finally, my number one film in 1981, Ragtime, an extraordinary portrait of the American nation and national character in 1906 and maybe now. Okay, we've looked at some of the year's best films, some on Gene's list, some on mine, some on both of our lists. But one thing that Gene and I do not do is collaborate on a single list of the year's best films. No way. Gene has his opinion, I have mine. Gene, why don't you go first? Okay, I'll start from the bottom of my list and work up. In the number 10 spot, Taylor Hackford's An Officer and a Gentleman with Richard Gere, Louis Gossett Jr., and Deborah Winger. Number 9, Das Boot from West Germany, the World War II submarine adventure story. Number 8, Francesco Rossi's Three Brothers from Italy, a study of the fragmentation of modern society by studying three brothers mourning the death of their mother. Robert Towns' personal best is number seven. I like the movie's definition of competitive excellence, trying to do the best one can each day. Number six, Rainer Werner Fassbinder's Lola, a modernization of the Blue Angel story set in 1950s Germany. Number five, Isfan Sabo's Mephisto, about an actor selling his soul for fame in Nazi Germany. Number four, Jean-Jacques Benek's brilliant French film debut, Diva. Number three, E.T. Enough said, it's on its way to becoming the top grossing film of all time. Number two, Sidney Pollack's Tootsie, more than the year's funniest film. It's a sly comment on sexual role playing, as well as a celebration of the pains and pleasures of being an actor. And number one, the best film of 1982, according to me, Jerzy Skolomowski's Moonlighting. Four workers from Poland building a house in a film that built a strong case against oppression of workers. Deeply moving and at the same time great joy in the filmmaking. Well, starting with my number 10 film on my list, I chose Wasn't That a Time? The joyous documentary about a reunion by the legendary folk quartet, The Weavers. Number nine, Sidney Lumet's The Verdict with a great performance by Paul Newman as an alcoholic lawyer trying to regain his self-respect. In eighth place, Moonlighting, the movie about Polish laborers stranded in London. My seventh place movie, Mephisto, had a brilliant performance by Klaus Maria Brandauer. Sixth place, Das Boot, the claustrophobic German thriller set on the submarine. Number five, Personal Best, the movie about two women athletes. Number four, a double selection, Werner Herzog's Fitzcarraldo, a film about a mad dreamer obsessed with the notion of dragging a steamship over dry land. And then Les Blank's documentary, Burden of Dreams, about Herzog's film and Herzog's own obsession with doing the same thing. In third place, Steven Spielberg's E.T. about the year's unlikeliest playmate. My second place movie was Diva, the stylish French thriller about opera, prostitution, and Zen Buddhism. And in first place, my choice for the best film of 1982, Alan Pakula's Sophie's Choice, starring Meryl Streep, Kevin Klein, and Peter McNichol in a battle between romance and self Now my countdown <laughs> in this space mode that we are in right now, my countdown of the top ten movies of 1983. Number ten is The Big Chill, the bittersweet 60s college reunion comedy. Number nine, like Risky Business, a comedy about a teenager's sexual and social awakening. Number eight, Eric Romay's French comedy, Pauline at the Beach, five characters chasing their vision of love. In seventh position, Silkwood with Meryl Streep in a terrific working-class movie. In number six, The Year of Living Dangerously, following an Australian journalist covering the Indonesian 1965 revolution. Number five is Star 80, following two characters who most of all want to be stars. Number four on my best ten list, Ingmar Bergman's epic drama, Fanny and Alexander. Number three is the film of Harold Pinter's play, Betrayal a shocking case study of marital infidelity starring Ben yeah. Kingsley and Jeremy Irons. And number two, Terms of Endearment, with its three great performances by McLean, Nicholson, and Winger. And my number one movie of the year, The Right Stuff, an American epic about technology and human values influenced by the media age. That's amazing. That means that our first and second films are the same. I think that's the first time in 
history that we've agreed even that we've much. We've been doing this for 15, 15 years? 15 years at least together. Yeah, here's a complete list of my top 10 films for 1983. Number 10, The Return of Martin Gere, a medieval romance that asserts a woman's right to choose her own lover. Number 9, Risky Business, a tricky teenage love affair. Eighth place, Say Amen Somebody, the rambunctious gospel documentary. Seventh, Silkwood, starring Meryl Streep in the story of an angry American worker. Sixth place, Testament, with a great performance by Jane Alexander as a mother holding her family together after nuclear war. Number five, El Norte, Gregory Navas, epic about Latin American immigrants, a beautiful film. In fourth place, Ingmar Bergman's Fanning Alexander. He says it's his last film, I hope it's not. Third, The Year of Living Dangerously, starring Mel Gibson, Sigourney Weaver, and Linda Hunt. Second place, the heartbreaking new movie, Terms of Endearment, and tops on my list, The Right Stuff, the astronaut picture. So, I like your list pretty much. I like your list pretty much, too, except for The Big Chill. That's the only one on your list that I wouldn't have on my choice of the year's 10 best films in order, reverse order. Number 10, Purple Rain, with a lot of music and a lot of truth from Prince. In ninth place, Choose Me, the offbeat comedy about saloon people, starring Javier Bujol, Keith Carradine, and Leslie Ann Warren. Eighth place, Stranger Than Paradise, with a Hungarian girl and three louts on an odyssey of discovery. Seventh, The Killing Fields, the heartbreaking story of a friendship between two journalists, one American, one Cambodian. Sixth place, Robert Altman's extraordinary secret honor, which imagines the confessions of Richard M. Nixon. In fifth place, Francis Coppola's wonderful new movie, The Cotton Club, exploring the worlds of jazz and crime in the 1920s. Fourth place, this is Spinal Tap, a brilliant and hilarious satire on the whole world of rock documentaries. Third place, John Cassavetes' Love Stream, starring Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins as two neurotics at the ends of their ropes. Second place, Paris, Texas, with Harry Dean Stanton as a wonder who tries to reunite his broken family. And the best film of the year, Milos Forman's Amadeus. And here's the rundown now, bottom to top for me. Number 10, Robert Redford in The Great Baseball Fable, The Natural. I loved every corny bit of it. Number 9, the year's funniest film, even funnier than Spinal Tap, Dudley Moore married to two pregnant women in Blake Edwards, Mickey and Maud. Number 8, David Lean's amazingly complete A Passage to India, a tremendous saga of two cultures failing to understand each other and more often than not, not trying to understand. Number seven, I like Secret Honor 2, that crazy funny film about Richard Nixon with an amazing performance by Philip Baker Hall. Number six, The Killing Fields, the Cambodian-based story of a remarkable friendship that triumphs over racism. Number five, Prince's film debut in Purple Rain. Number four, from France, Diane Curie's Entre Nous, an epic story of the friendship between two women with one liberating the other. Number three, Francis Coppola's epic, The Cotton Club. And number two, Milos Forman's Amadeus, and the best film of 1984, says me, Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in America, with a towering performance by Robert De Niro. You know, it wasn't that bad of a year. This is a pretty good year. You know, the funny thing about your list is I liked all the films on it for a change. <laughs> I, I, there <laughs> have been a few years, and that hasn't been the I'm case. I'm going to review our individual choices for the year's best films, going through our entire list, bottom to top. And my tenth place film is Blood Simple, one of the year's most ingenious and blood-curdling thrillers. In ninth place, Streetwise, the heartbreaking documentary about young kids growing up on the streets of Seattle. Number eight, Lost in America, Albert Brooks' comedy about the American dream of success. Seventh place, Mad Max, Beyond Thunderdome, a great-looking, high-style thriller, the best of the Road Warrior movies. Number six, Witness, with Harrison Ford as a cop who lives among the Amish community. Number five, Ran, a Kira Kurosawa's movie about the King Lear legend. Number four, Pritzi's Honor, the John Huston film with those great Jack Nicholson and Kathleen Turner performances. Number three, The Falcon and the Snowman with two more great performances by Timothy Hutton and Sean Penn. And in second place, Martin Scorsese's hard-edged comedy of big city life, After Hours. And of course, my choice for the top film on the list, Steven Spielberg's wonderful heartfelt drama, The Color Purple. And now I'll give you my list from bottom to top. Number 10, The Purple Rose of Cairo, Woody Allen's tribute to the movie. Number 9, Back to the Future, a wonderful commercial comedy with a great lesson about how kids look at their parents. Number 8, The Falcon and the Snowman, the story of boys playing at being men. Number 7, Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters, Paul Schrader's film of a writer's life and words and death. Number 6, The Official Story, an Argentinian drama about a woman awakening to the political treachery that gave her a baby. Number five, Pritzi's Honor, the family drama about murdering lovers. Number four, Streetwise, a heartbreaking documentary about Seattle's three children 
Number three, The Color Purple, a story of triumph over abuse. Number two, Ron, the epic story of a warlord's loss of power but gain of wisdom. And finally, Shoah, the extraordinary documentary on the Holocaust. Two pretty good lists. You know, people have talked about how this was a bad year for America. It was movies. a bad year. And you know the odd thing? How few foreign language films are really on either one of our lists compared to years past when half of the titles have been from overseas. It was a bad, li bad year for American films, but there were some good films in the mix. I think you're right. That's it for... Here's a rundown of my list from bottom to top. Number 10, the romantic horror film The Fly. Number 9, Round Midnight, the jazz tribute to Americans in Paris starring saxophonist Dexter Gordon. Number 8, a beautiful love story, Children of a Lesser God. Number 7, the Vietnam drama Platoon. Number 6, the controversial horror film Blue Velvet. Number five, Francis Coppola's time travel drama, Peggy Sue Got Married. Number four, Mona Lisa, a bittersweet love story set in the English porno world starring Bob Hoskins and Kathy Tyson. Number three, a wonderful English drama, A Room with a View. Number two, Agnes Varda's French drama, Vagabond. And number one, Woody Allen, Hannah and Her Sisters. And now let's take a look at my top ten list. In tenth place, Hard Choices with a great performance by Margaret Clink as a counselor who falls in love with her young prisoner. Number nine, Francis Coppola's Peggy Sue Got Married with Kathleen Turner. Number eight, Down and Out in Beverly Hills. Number seven, Alan Rudolph's Trouble in Mind, a story of crime and redemption in a world that seemed made up out of old movies. Number six, Agnes Varda's Vagabond. Number five, Lucas. In fourth place, Sid and Nancy. Number three, Woody Allen's Hannah and Her Sisters. Number two, Bertrand Tavernier's Round Midnight. And number one, the best film of 1986, Oliver Stone's Platoon. And it was a good year for movies. Yeah. I was surprised when I made it my list. How many titles contended for those titles? I had positions? 19. That's a record for me. And you know what? We agreed on five films. That means you were half right and I was half right. Oh, okay, now here is my complete list of the top 10 films of 1987, starting with number 10 and working our way up. Steve Martin in number 10 slot. Very charming, very funny in Roxanne. Number nine, Stephen Frears, Prick Up Your Ears, about a doomed affair between a successful playwright and his self-hating artist lover. Eight, Tim Hunter's teenage drama, River's Edge. Seven, Woody Allen's bittersweet radio days. Number six, Norman Jewison's hilarious Moonstruck. Number five, James L. Brooks's broadcast news. Number four, the French epic of murder and cover-up in a small village, Jean de Florette and its companion film that finishes the story, Manon of the Spring. Third, David Mamet's House of Games. Number two, Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket, a cold rumination on the nature of man as revealed in Vietnam. And finally, the number one film, that great epic, The Last Emperor. Boy, I like that list as I hear it. Of course, I wrote it. Well, I knew you liked the Kubrick film, and now I see how much you liked it. That was not one of my top films of the year. Now for my list of the top ten movies of 1987, starting with number ten, Housekeeping, by Bill Forsythe, starring Christine Lottie as a woman who may be mad or only magical. Number nine, Lethal Weapon, the year's best action picture with Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. Number eight on my list, Broadcast News by James Brooks. In seventh place, Woody Allen's Radio Days. Number six, Pick Up Your Ears with brilliant performances by Gary Oldman and Alfred Molina. In fifth place, Moonstruck. Number four, The Last Emperor, first on Gene's list. Number three, Barfly, with those daring performances by Mickey Rourke and Faye Dunaway, not on Gene's list. Number two, The Big Easy from New Orleans. And number one, David Mamet's House of Games. I think it's been a pretty good year for the movies, actually, yeah. as I look at this what's list of films and other ones that we could have mentioned. What's interesting to me is that we agreed on six, which is an all-time record for mm -hmm. us, and what that tells me is that the films that were good this year were very good and declared themselves. What it tells themselves. me is that your taste is getting better the longer you work with Here me. Here now, from bottom to top, is my top ten list. Number ten is Working Girl, the old-fashioned story of a young woman trying to make it in the business world. Melanie Griffith stars, Mike Nichols directs. Number nine, Phil Kaufman's The Unbearable Lightness of Being, the most erotic film of the year, set against the political struggle of Prague in 1968. Number eight, Marcel Ophel's scathing documentary, Hotel Terminus, The Life and Times of Klaus Barbie, which is more than a prosecution of an infamous Nazi Gestapo leader. It's an indictment of all of the people who protected him for 40 years, including the American intelligence community. Number seven, Errol Morris's The Thin Blue Line, a very different documentary, a poetic elliptical one that tries to prove the innocence of a man who received a life sentence for the murder of a Dallas policeman. Number six, Martin Brest's Midnight Run, the best action comedy of the year, featuring the best duet of the year, the comic relationship between Robert De Niro as a bounty hunter and Charles Grodin as the hunted. Number five, Lawrence Kazan's Bittersweet, The Accidental Tourist, starring William Hurt as a hyper-organized man whose life is really falling apart. 
And now my top four again. Number four, Little Dorrit. Number three, the hilarious Bull Durham. Number two, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And finally, number one, the best film of 1988, according to me, Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ. Okay, now here's my complete list of the year's top ten films. Number ten, Running on Empty, directed by Sidney Lumet, the story of two 60s radicals who have been running ever since and trying to raise a family at the same time. Number nine, the brilliant documentary, Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam, which combined letters from American troops in Vietnam with dramatic footage of the war they fought. Number eight, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, directed by Robert Zemeckis, with animation by Richard Williams. Number seven, Vim Vender's haunting movie, Wings of Desire, about an angel who wants to be a human because he would rather have real physical feelings than live forever. Number six on my list, the year's funniest comedy, A Fish Called Wanda, about a gang of incompetent crooks caught in the cockeyed British legal establishment. Number five, Salam Bombay by Mira Nair, a movie shot on the streets of Bombay and telling the dramatic story of a boy who lives and survives and even prevails there. And of course, my top four films, reviewing them again, number four, Shy People, number three, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, number two, The Accidental Tourist, and number one, the year's best film, Alan Parker's Mississippi Burning. So, good year, good list. And the first time that we ever each picked a film as number one that wasn't on the other guy's top film list. And it's number one on both of our lists. Now here is my entire list of the year's 10 best movies. Number 10 on the list, Say Anything, written and directed by Cameron Crowe, which may have looked like another teenage movie, but was actually an intelligent, perceptive story of human nature with great performances by Ione Skye, John Cusack, and John Mahoney. Number nine, Bruce Beresford's Driving Miss Daisy, based on the play by Alfred Urey, with its wonderful rapport between Morgan Freeman and Jessica Tandy as a middle-aged chauffeur and the old southern lady who thinks she doesn't need a chauffeur until he convinces her otherwise. Number eight, Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors, his best movie since Hannah and Her Sisters, starring Martin Landau as a man who allows a murder to take place just to make life a little easier for himself. Number seven, Field of Dreams, written and directed by Phil Alden Robinson and starring Kevin Costner in a fabulous fantasy about an Iowa farmer who builds a baseball diamond in his cornfield and sees the ghosts of the past playing ball there. As I said earlier, number six on my list was The Mighty Quinn, written by Hampton Fancher and directed by Carl Schinkel. Number five, Roger and Me, written and directed by Michael Moore. Number four, Born on the Fourth of July, directed by Oliver Stone and written by Stone and Ron Kovic. Number three, My Left Foot, directed by Jim Sheridan and co-written by Sheridan and Shane Connaughton. Number two, Drugstore Cowboy, directed by Gus Van Sant Jr. and written by Van Sant and Daniel Yost. And number one, the best film of 1989 was Do the Right Thing, written and directed by Spike Lee. And now here from number 10 to number one are my choices of the best films of 1989. Number 10, Danny DeVito's film of Warren Adler's novel of divorce American style, brutal style, The War of the Roses, with a screenplay by Michael Leeson, a film aggressively nasty with a simple message, divorce is brutal. Number nine, Cameron Crowe's Say Anything, a most intelligent teenage love story that also featured a rare movie relationship between a troubled father and his devoted daughter. We don't get too many of those kinds of stories. Number eight, writer-director Steve Cloves, The Fabulous Baker Boys, a smart and mature entertainment about a couple of brothers whose musical careers take off, but whose personal relationship founders when a glamorous singer enters their lives. Number seven, Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors, which I've come to view as nothing less than an investigation of whether God exists. And the answer here is, not likely. And recapping now, my top movie picks, number six, the animated feature, The Little Mermaid. Number five, Oliver Stone's Born on the Fourth of July. Number four, Paul Mazursky's Enemies, A Love Story. Number three, Gus Van Sant Jr.'s Drugstore Cowboy. Number two, Michael Moore's wildly funny and angry Roger and Me. And finally, number one, clearly in my opinion, the best film of 1989, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. And you know, there's one thing that just jumps right out for me from our two lists. No foreign films. Neither one of us no. a single foreign film. This is the first time that's happened to me in 22 years. I, it may be, it was also for me, and uh, Eric Romer always makes my list, and I didn't think his film this year was the that special. The best ones I saw were Shock a Lot by Claire Dennis. That was number 11 And Electrice, another very good movie. Yeah, Shock a Lot was real close Foreign call. films are not really doing too well in America these days, either coming here or being in, in all that great when they get here. That's it. The special show on the best films we saw this past year, from bottom to top, 
my list of the 10 best films of 1990. Number 10, The Godfather Part 3. It's not in the same league as the first two, but it is quite powerful and rich nonetheless. Number 9, Andrew Bergman's offbeat comedy, The Freshman. Number 8, the Klaus von Bülow, Alan Dershowitz story, Reversal of Fortune. Number 7, Kevin Costner's stirring revival of the Western genre, Dances with Wolves. Number 6, the year's best action movie with Bruce Willis as the reluctant hero in Rennie Harlan's Die Hard 2. Number five, Bertrand Blier's odd romance with Gerard Depardieu falling for a plain woman over his beautiful wife in Too Beautiful for You. Number four, The Plot Against Harry. Number three, Barry Levinson's immigrant drama A Family Disintegration, Avalon. And number two, James Foley's dark love story with Jason Patrick in a star-making performance after Dark My Sweet. And the number one best film of 1990, Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. And yours? So those are your ten and my ten choices in order. We're number ten, Bob Rafelson's Mountains of the Moon, the epic story of the great Victorian explorer Richard Burton and his compulsive search for the sources of the Nile. Number nine, Peter Greenaway's The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover, the scathing and shocking allegory of a corrupt modern society all told within the walls of a restaurant that's a version of hell. Number eight, Penny Marshall's Awakenings, the story of a modern-day Rip Van Winkle. Number seven, Uli Adele's shocking and hard-hitting last exit to Brooklyn with its lost souls in a bleak urban landscape. Number six, a sleeper worth looking for, Alejandro Jodorowsky's Santa Sangre, a visionary fable set in the circus world about a woman with no arms and her son who fears he has no soul. Number five, Barbara Schroeder's Reversal of Fortune with Jeremy Irons as Klaus von Bülow. Number four, Stephen Frears' The Grifters, the cynical and ironic crime story with great performances by John Cusack, Angelica Houston, and Annette Bening. Number three, Dances with Wolves, the story of a man who gets to know American Indians for himself. Number two, Patrice Leconte's Monsieur Hire. And number one, my choice as the best film of the year, Goodfellas. And let me say something right now, because you and I have picked Goodfellas, Every critics group has picked Goodfellas. I think maybe it might be time for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Scientists mm -hmm. to make some recognition of the fact that Martin Scorsese is alive and working in the film industry today. He made the best movie of the 80s, Raging Bull, according to every poll that was taken anywhere. The best movie of the 70s, Taxi Driver. Now he's made Goodfellas, and they'll probably wind up giving the, the prize again to some respectable little do-gooding picture or something. Well, it may be Kevin Costner's Dances with Wolves, which is the third well, on your list. Yeah, we'll yeah, see. yeah, but still, no, I, I, would, I mean, we're that's a good picture, but Scorsese is up there in a different category. It, it, he is in a different category. Three films that we agreed on, Dances with Wolves, uh, Goodfellas, and uh, Barbara Schroeder's uh, Reversal of Fortune. So we have seven differences in our list. It was not a great, having said that all, uh, complimented the, the Scorsese picture, it was not a great year for films. Would you agree? I only gave four stars to eight movies. That's real low year. for you. Yeah. Okay. So much. Now we're both going to read our complete list of the best films of 1991 from the bottom to the top. And number 10 on my list is The Rapture by Michael Tolkien with a great and brave performance by Mimi Rogers as a swinger who suddenly starts taking God very seriously. Number 9, Thelma and Louise. Number 8, Robert Mulligan's The Man on the Moon, a story about growing up, falling in love, and dealing with life's realities. Number seven, Life is Sweet by Mike Lee, an oddball comedy about a London suburban family and their twin daughters, one normal, one determined to be wacky. Number six, Paul Cox's A Woman's Tale, which will open around the country in the next month or two. Number five, a duet from France by Yves Robert, My Father's Glory and My Mother's Castle, based on the memoirs of Marcel Pagnol about a young man growing up in the French countryside. Number four, Lawrence Kasdan's Grand Canyon. Number three, the wonderfully entertaining animated film, Beauty and the Beast. Number two, Boys in the Hood. And number one, as we just heard, Oliver Stone's JFK. And now for my list. Number ten, Lasse Hallstrom's Once Around, a romantic comedy with Richard Dreyfuss and Holly Hunter that argues you ought to grab love wherever you can find it. Number nine, Daddy Nostalgia, Bertrand Tavernier's moving account of reconciliation between a dying man and his daughter. Number eight, Judo, the tragedy about star-crossed Chinese lovers. Number seven, Oliver Stone's JFK, his speculation on the Kennedy assassination. Number six, as mentioned earlier, Lawrence Kasdan's Grand Canyon. Number five, Beauty and the Beast. Number four, Jacques Rivette's La Belle Noiseuse, a fascinating four-hour drama about an old painter renewed by a beautiful young model 
one of the best films ever made about the creative process with plenty of time devoted to actual drawing and painting. Number three, John Singleton's Boys in the Hood, and incidentally, I was wrong earlier, he went to USC film school, not UCLA. Number two, Jane Campion's An Angel at My Table, and number one, the best film of 1991, according to me, Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse, that film had played on pay TV, It'll be coming to movie theaters, see it on a big screen. Okay, well, I have to congratulate you, Gene. You don't have any bad movies on your list this year. Thank you. Okay. Okay, here from bottom to top is my complete list of the 10 best films of 1992. Number 10, Andy Davis's Under Siege with Steven Seagal. Number 9, Mississippi Masala, the interracial love story between an African-American carpet cleaner played by Denzel Washington. He's in two films on my list this year and an East Indian daughter of a Mississippi motel manager in a year of many interracial love stories. This was the best. Mira Nair directs. Number eight, Penelope Spears's Wayne's World, a fresh comedy with Dana Carvey and Mike Myers. Number seven, Louis Malle's Damage with Jeremy Irons and Juliette Binoche. Number six, Patrice Leconte's The Hairdresser's Husband, another tale of obsessive love. In this case, a Frenchman who can't keep his hands off his wife, who is also a barber. Number five, Spike Lee's Malcolm X, a towering epic of a constantly evolving soul and featuring Denzel Washington's Oscar caliber performance. Number four, Neil Jordan's The Crying Game from Ireland. Number three, James Ivory's Howard's End, based on the Ian Forrester novel of a social climbing in Edwardian England. Number two, Robert Altman's The Player, a wicked comedy about fear and trembling in the Hollywood corporate suite. And number one, the best film of 1992, Say I, is Carl Franklin's thriller one false move that's a good list yes it is and my list is also a good list my 10 best movies of 1992 include number 10 bad lieutenant with harvey keitel in a dangerous risky performance as a new york cop out of control abel ferrara directed it's a film that's hard to watch and impossible to forget number nine clint eastwood's unforgiven number eight robert altman's the player Number seven, a real treasure, the hairdresser's husband. I liked it too, Gene, just as much as you did. Number six, Louis Mal's Damage. Number five, Neil Jordan's electrifying thriller, The Crying Game. Number four, a wonderful film, Flirting, directed by John Deegan, set in a boarding school in the 1960s and exploring the funny, bittersweet coming of age of an Australian teenager and the daughter of an African intellectual. Number three, Howard's End by Merchant and Ivory. Number two, a crime movie that was also about real human values, Carl Franklin's One False Move, one of those movies that amazes you by taking real chances and never stepping wrong. And number one on my list, Spike Lee's Malcolm X. So there are six titles that are the same on the two lists, and the one that's missing on yours that I'm really surprised by is Flirting, because you liked it so much I when we reviewed it. it. I liked it very much. And Probably it was number 11 or something. Well, it was in the next five, actually, okay. as a matter so of fact. So Schindler's fact. List first on both of our lists. What, what else is on your list? Okay, let me read now my entire top ten list from bottom to top, starting with... Number 10, Vincent Ward's Map of the Human Heart, a youthful love story spanning decades and locations as varied as an Eskimo ice flow and London during the German Blitz of World War II. Number 9, Steven Soderbergh's Depression Story, King of the Hill. Number 8, Wayne Wang's The Joy Luck Club. Number 7, Martin Scorsese's The Age of Innocence. Number 6, Andrew Davis's classic Hollywood thriller. This was certainly one of the most exciting films out of Hollywood in a long time, The Fugitive. Number 5, Menace to Society. Number 4, Chen Kaiga's Farewell My Concubine. Number 3, Jane Campion's feminist love story, The Piano. Number 2, Robert Altman's Shortcuts. And the number 1 best film of 1993, Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List. Okay, now here's my list of the year's best films. Number 10, Ruby in Paradise by Victor Nunes with a glowing performance by Ashley Judd as an independent young woman who makes her own way in the world. Number 9, What's Love Got to Do With It? Number 8, Menace to Society. Number 7, Like Water for Chocolate, the enchanting magical Mexican film about a woman who poured all of her passion and a lot of other good stuff, too, into her recipes. Number six, California, a great film. Don't let this one get away. Number five, The Joy Luck Club. Number four, the year's best action thriller, The Fugitive, with Harrison Ford on the run and Tommy Lee Jones after him. Number three, The Piano, with its special performances by Holly Hunter and Harvey Keitel. Number two, Martin Scorsese's The Age of Innocence. And number one on my list, the year's best film, Steven Spielberg's great and daring epic Schindler's List, and you know, if you just added these two lists together and started looking at them, you'd see some great movies. It is really very exciting as uh, 
we conclude this century, this first century of, Amer of world filmmaking, and we are getting great films from all over the world now. New Zealand, China, England, and America, too. Achievement. Now let's take a look at the 10 best films on my list. Number 10, as mentioned, Gillian Armstrong's Little Women. Number 9, Red Rock West, John Dahl's darkly humorous thriller starring Nicolas Cage as a sweet sap mistaken for a hitman in a small Wyoming town. It's available on home video. Number 8, The Shawshank Redemption, an impressive directing debut by Frank Darabont. Number 7, Vanya on 42nd Street, Louis Miles' fresh update of Chekhov's Uncle Vanya with a script adapted by David Mamet. Number 6, Forrest Gump. We didn't leave this baby out. The most beloved movie of the year. Number five, Robert Redford's Quiz Show, a rare American film of ideas. Number four, the Canadian docudrama, 32 short films about Glenn Gould. Number three, Tim Burton's beautiful black and white, Ed Wood. Number two, Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction. And my number one film of the year is Hoop Dreams. Okay, now let's take a look at all ten titles on my list of the year's best films. Number 10, Robert Redford's Quiz Show, A Study in Corruption and Temptation. Number 9, Michael Tolkien's Biting Satire, The New Age, starring Judy Davis and Peter Weller as an affluent Beverly Hills couple who discover the realities of unemployment. Number 8, Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers. Number 7, Tian Zhang Zhang's The Blue Kite, another epic film from China, as that emerging nation re-examines its own turbulent recent history. Number 6, Boaz Yakin's Fresh, starring Sean Nelson in a riveting performance as an 11-year-old street kid who uses chess strategy to carry out an elaborate revenge against the drug dealers who are destroying his neighborhood. Number five, John Dahl's The Last Seduction with that electrifying performance by Linda Fiorentino. Number four, Robert Zemeckis' Forrest Gump with Tom Hanks as the simple-minded everyman who travels through four decades of American history. Number three, Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction. Number two, the trilogy of Blue, White, and Red by Krzysztof Kieslowski. And number one, the year's best film, The Wonderful Hoop Dreams. It's not often that we agree on the year's best film, but we sure do this year. Actually, two years in a row, we both picked Schindler's List That's last right. year. The good stuff does really, the great stuff declares itself. We're going to each read our full personal list of the year's best films. Number 10 on my list, the gloriously romantic A Walk in the Clouds by Alfonso Arau, the man who directed Like Water for Chocolate, and told the love story of a young GI and a girl in trouble. Number 9, Christopher Hampton's Carrington. Number 8, My Family by Gregory Nava and Anna Thomas. Number seven on my list, Adam Agoyan's Exotica. Number six, Ron Howard's Apollo 13. Number five, Martin Scorsese's Casino. Number four, by Oliver Stone, Nixon. Number three, Tim Robbins's Dead Man Walking. Number two, by Terry Zweigoff, Crumb. And number one on my list, the best film of the year, Leaving Las Vegas. Okay, now to recap my top ten. Number ten, Claude Lelouch's risky job of reworking Les Miserables into a World War II story. Number nine, Ron Howard's Apollo 13. Eight, Adam McGoyan's Adult Exotica. Seven, Rob Reiner's The American President with a resplendent Annette Benning. Number six, Leaving Las Vegas. Number five, Tim Robbins' death row piece, Dead Man Walking. Number four, Chris Noonan's fantasy called Babe. Number three, Oliver Stone's Nixon. Number two, John Lasseter's Toy Story. Talk about a piece of work for a director. And number one, my favorite film of 1995, Terry Zweigoff's Crumb. That's it for Dean and I are both going to give our full list of the year's best films. Number ten on my list, Big Night, directed by Campbell Scott and Stanley Tucci. Number nine, Heidi Fleiss, the year's best documentary with a stranger-than-fiction story of the Hollywood madam and the sinister figures behind her scandal. Number eight, Woody Allen's Everyone Says I Love You. Number seven, Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet. Number six, Bound by Larry and Andy Wachowski. Number five on my list, Welcome to the Dow House, directed and written by Todd Solon. Fourth on the list, John Sayles' Lone Star. Number three, Mike Lee's daring family drama, Secrets and Lies. Number two, Lars von Trier's visionary Breaking the Waves, with a great Oscar-caliber performance by Emily Watson as a young Scottish woman who loves her man so much, she hopes for a miracle. And number one, the best film of the year on my list, Fargo, by the Coen brothers. And now for my list of the top films of 1996. Number ten, Bound by the Wachowski brothers. Number nine, Kingpin, the year's funniest movie, A Laugh Riot, directed by Peter and Bobby Farrelly. Number eight on my list. Todd Solon's Welcome to the Dollhouse. Number seven, the documentary Paradise Lost, 
by Joe Berlinger and Bruce Donosky about a murder trial that could have possibly gone terribly wrong. Number six, another terrific documentary, Al Pacino's Looking for Richard. Number five, Lone Star by John Fales. Number four, Anthony Minghella's The English Patient. Number three, Breaking the Ways, directed by Lars von Trier. Number two, Mike Lee's Secrets and Lies. And my number one pick of the year, Fargo, by the Coen brothers. I wish they made a movie a week. Our lives would well, be so much better. All I have to say, Gene, is when we disagree, one of us is wrong. But when we agree, both of us are right. Excellent like logic. To, thank you. <laughs> Good test. Could this movie that I'm making take place anywhere? Why not put it someplace specific? And now, here is my full list. Number 10, James L. Brooks is as good as it gets. A comic so. drama with Jack Nicholson as a mean old man. Really mean. Number 9, John Madden's Mrs. Brown, the story of Queen Victoria and a stable master companion who lights up her very dark life. Number 8, Gus Van Sant's Goodwill Hunting. Number 7, Adam McGoyan's The Sweet Hereafter, about a town trying to put itself back together after a tragic bus accident. Number 6, Peter Cataneo's The Full Monty. Number five, Vim Bender's somber Hollywood satire, The End of Violence. Number four, Neil LeBute's In the Company of Men, a horrifying film about the worst impulses of men. Number three, Barry Levinson's Wag the Dog. Number two, Curtis Hansen's L.A. Confidential. And number one, the best movie I saw in 1997, Ang Lee's The Ice Storm. Okay, here's my complete list of the year's best films. Number ten, Barry Levinson's Wag the Dog. Number nine, James Cameron's Titanic. Number eight, Neil Abutes in the Company of Men with its savage portrait of male tricksters in a corporate environment. Number seven, Curtis Hansen's L.A. Confidential. Number six, Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, the haunting and elegiac documentary by Errol Morris about four strange men who are obsessed with controlling that which cannot be controlled. Number five, Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown. Number four, Mabarosi, directed by Hirokazu Koreeda. Number three, Paul Thomas Anderson's Boogie Nights. Number two, Adam McGoyan's The Sweet Hereafter. And number one on my list, the best film of the year is Eve's Bayou by Casey Lemons. Then and now, as promised, each of our lists of the top ten movies of 1998, starting with mine. Number ten, the inventive Irish village comedy, the wonderful waking Ned Devine, written and directed by Kirk Jones. Number nine, the Fairley Brothers, There's Something About Mary. Number eight, Simon Birch, written and directed by Mark Stephen Johnson, about a little boy who challenges every one of us with his faith in God. Number seven, Ant, directed by Eric Darnell and Tim Johnson, with a Woody Allen character adding adult appeal. Number six, The Truman Show, directed by Peter Weir. Number five, John Madden's Shakespeare in Love. Number four, Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. Number three, Gary Ross's Pleasantville. Number two, Terrence Malick's The Thin Red Line. And the number one film of the year, George Miller's sequel, Babe, Pig in the City. Okay, now on to my list. Number ten, Primary Colors by Mike Nichols. Number nine, Life is Beautiful, the film about humor as a weapon of survival by Roberto Benigni. Number eight, Shakespeare in Love by John Madden. Number seven, George Miller's unfairly neglected Babe, Pig in the City. Number six, Elizabeth by Shaker Kapoor. Number five, Happiness by Todd Solons, a tragic comedy about lonely people driven to desperation. Number four, A Simple Plan by Sam Raimi, the stunning story of four people who think they can get away with stealing a fortune. Number three, Steven Spielberg's brilliant war epic Saving Private Ryan. Number two, Pleasantville by Gary Ross. And number one, my choice as the year's best film, Dark City by Alex Proyas. Now,